there, Biology 11. Mr. B here, filling in one of the final topics, Phylum Echinodermata. It's a fancy name, but what does it really mean? It means things like sand dollars and starfish. Uh, if you've ever been, ever been to an aquarium, you've seen these. Uh, if you ever go for a trip down to the beach, um, go check out the tidal pools, because that's where you'll see these, um, and notably in shallow water. You don't have to go too far out to find these little darlings. So let's say a little bit more about them and get right into this topic. The first thing I want you to understand is, uh, remember that a phylum is one level below a kingdom. So what we're looking at is kingdom animalia. And now we're looking at phylum echinodermata. The name echino, uh, or the prefix if you will, means spiny and derma means skin. So we have a large group of animals that have uh, spiny skin. Now you might ask yourself, what, what do you mean spiny? If you've ever run your finger over a starfish, you'll feel the little sort of, almost like, it feels like little bony spines. And that's a very good analogy or something to bear in mind because that's calcium carbonate. And when we look at a kind of dermata, what kind of gets us excited as biologists is we see calcium carbonate being used not only on the, on the outside and giving them a spiny skin, but when you go inside and you look at the structure of a starfish, which up until probably this point you haven't done, you will see that they have a calcium carbonate endoskeleton. Now remember, if you remember back to the beginning of the course, we talked about this, this interesting comparison uh, between ourselves and starfish. Uh, in case you don't remember, we're both what we call deuterostomes. So as our fertilized cell, the zygote, divides and becomes many cells, a blastocyst, what happens is when that hollow balls of, ball of cells begins to uh, form its digestive tract or a tube that goes all the way through the body, the first thing that forms, the first um, pinching inwards of that ball is, is anal. And that carries through and pinches forward and you get the basically the formation of the endoderm, that hollow tube that goes through us, but it's sort of anus first is the way that works. Not all critters uh, have, the, have that happening. We do, starfish do, and it's, if we go back to our cladistics or our cladograms from the beginning of the course, it's something that we share in common and it, it's, it's just a way of thinking of us as being sort of in a similar group. We do something similar in our development. Okay, so that's background, and I know that's a lot of it. Let's get going, okay? So starfish, there's many varieties. So on the course site, what I want to point out to you is that we've got a few here, okay? And I'm just going to zoom in. Major classes, crinoidea, asteroidea, holothuroidea, and we'll just kind of go with those. Now, if these are major classes, what do they look like? Well, let's take a little tour I've already got this kind of set up for you. Here we go. Now what we have here is we're going to look at the crinoids. You would look at these and for a long time, like just about anybody would, these looked plant-like. Now these are filter feeders. Let's take a peek here. There we go. So our crinoids are fairly interesting looking critters. Uh, let's see if I can get larger images. Here you go. They have this beautiful sort of feathery appearance looking like this. Um, when you look at, this is a neat just sort of generalized diagram here and I'll just zoom in on this. They're fixed to the bottom by a hold fast and they have a stalk which leads up to, you think of these as starfish arms and they use this, they hold this up in the water column and they use it to filter feed with. Um, several examples here. Here's a beautiful one. Let's look at that. There you go. And you could see how this could have been mis mistaken for plant material. They're just waving and they're capturing food and then just bringing it down to the animal to consume. So very nice looking. So that is what we call class crinoidea. Now let's sneak on over to echinoidea. You would probably know this best. This is a purple sea urchin. And we've seen many examples of this before. Here's um, sort of a typical urchin. But one of the things I think people forget is that sand dollars 
are like flattened sea urchins. So you'll notice in some of the pictures it comes up. Uh, this neat little arrangement here. Think of arms of a starfish, and that's kind of what you're seeing here in a way. These things have uh, symmetry, what we call radial symmetry, and it comes to a point, and not only any form of symmetry, what we're looking at here is penta radial, radial symmetry. The symmetry you'd find sort of over five parts of the body, if you think of it as being cut into five pieces of pie. So very neat. Pretty little example there. Zoom in on that. Many varieties in this class. When I went to the University of Victoria, um, they gave us a nice little tour down of the Inner Harbor, and they were bringing up these sea urchins. It's really neat. The chewing parts are on the bottom side. A lot of what sea urchins will consume, uh, a lot of what they're eating, are the holdfasts of brown algae. They literally chew the I'll, have, I'll say roots, even though they're not true roots, that are holding on, that's I guess why they call them holdfasts, to, to the bottom to sort of anchor the plant. When you get a chance to take a, a, a gander, more or less, at, oops, didn't want to move that, there we go, the internals, this is where you find, oh, you know, not only does it have a um, the mouth, the chewing surface down here, and it's got all these little sort of tube feet, which we'll talk about more as I go on in lecture for moving around. But there's primitive organs in here, and the anus is on the top. When we look at starfish, it's not, well, or anything really in a kind of dermata. It's very difficult to say that they have an anterior and a posterior. What we refer to it as is the chewing surface we call the oral, and the top side we call aboral, which means not the oral side, more or less. That's neat. So we'll, don't worry, we're going to get into that. Here's one more, Holothroidea. You might know this as the little warty pickle that we call a, uh, there we go, sea cucumber. And I like this picture first. I want to show you this because we have to look at what it really is. It's got little walky feet around the outside. Starfish have this on the ab oral side of their arms. Uh, these are tube feet. And they're like little suction cups that help move it along the bottom. These things are like vacuum cleaners of the sea. I know we said that about sponges, but these little critters will eat just about anything that they can find. There's a mouth here, branching tentacles here. They'll consume almost anything. And they, they clean up the sand very well. In fact, they'll consume the feces of other organisms and process them even more. So you ask a question, can you eat a sea cucumber? I was watching a television program uh, a little while back where there's five muscles on the inside that you can literally tear out and that's about all you can consume in a sea cucumber. They also have a tremendous uh, defense um, which well involves extruding or releasing their intestines, toxic intestines, from their anus and uh, I guess more or less daring predators to eat it. Predators uh, uh, usually don't take them up on that offer. You can imagine it'd be pretty gross. Um, they can regenerate very well. In fact, almost everything, well, I can't think of anything that doesn't, in Echinodermata can regenerate. Now, I'll explain the exceptions to that regeneration process, but they can do this very well. So here's our warty little pickle on the bottom. There you go. A little trip through Google Images will give you all sorts of nice views on this. Yes, they can be, be eaten, but that's be a fairly interesting delicacy, I think, on the table. Um, literally, the, I've seen the muscles stripped out. Um, I would suggest popping out to Google and saying, uh, going to Google, searching for videos, and search for, um, well, search for these guys, and uh, I'd cross-reference that with a recipe. That ought to be interesting viewing. Okay, so back to our lesson. So let's Let's go into a little bit of our um, uh, note taking or information gathering and I'll come back and talk about how it is that these little critters, uh, how their physiology works. Okay, so, and we're live. There we go. So 28.4 echinoderms. Now some of this I've already sort of described but let's get a little bit out of the way. What distinguishes an echinoderm? Well, as the name suggests, spiny skin, 
is what we, how we've named them. But I think it's really important to point out, actually critical to point out, that they have an... In, ooh, that doesn't work. They have an internal endoskeleton. Let's pick a better color. Lighten it up a little bit here. Let's go with a... I don't know. An orange. And I have to... Sorry, folks. I have to take its transparency down. Otherwise, you can't see through it. There you go. It has an internal skeleton. Okay, calcium carbonate. So let's make a little note of that. Chemistry, C. Hmm. Come on, stylus. C-A-C-O-3. Water vascular system. Now, that's kind of interesting when they mention this. Um, a water vascular system, what they have is a water pumping system. And that's pretty critical because what it does is allows their little suction cups to move them around on the bottom. It also allows them to transport things around inside of their bodies. So you have to sort of think about that as, is that also a possible circulatory system? Absolutely. Absolutely. We've got little suction cup like structures that we call tube feet. Let's put a little note around that because that's pretty important. And they have what we call five-part radial symmetry or pentaradial. I'm going to stick to block capitals. Pentaradial. And what that means is, if you've ever seen a star uh, drawn like this, there's five axis points here around the center. Now, I haven't drawn it perfectly, but if this is the center, one, two, three, four, and five. So that explains that pretty well. Okay. Ooh, nice blank page. What is an echinoderm? Well, it's an animal, and it's a pretty interesting one at that. There we go. I must have had a redundant page. They've got a, a an endoskeleton, not different from ours, but it's just arranged kind of into plates. When you look at the internal anatomy of these little guys, you look at it in the... Whenever I do the dissection, I always say the little plates are lined up in these little... They're like one after the other after the other. And it would make you think kind of of your vertebrae, but just they're almost identical. Little tiny plates, one after the other. Um, you could sort of think of them as almost like little... Um, uh, bony staples and they they're all fit together and they form this long sort of piece of internal bone we'll get to that i'll show you all of that uh, the skin of the echinoderm um it's it's it's, it's interesting the outside is hard but once you dissect it and you feel the inside with your finger it feels very smooth so this is all stretched over an endoskeleton. Now think about it. We were looking at the arthropods a little while ago, and they have an exoskeleton made up of a interesting carbohydrate called chitin. Now this idea of having an endoskeleton is what makes up, well, let's talk about vertebrates being the 5% of animals on the planet that go for an endoskeleton. So it's pretty interesting. This is... This is a very distant relative that went with the endoskeleton. It's sort of part of our evolutionary heritage. I was stating earlier that you can't really say that these things have an anterior and a posterior. They're not really like us with a head and feet. It's not that distinct. They don't have a, well, cephalization. There it is. Okay. They don't have a head. Um, so you, they do have some sensory or uh, ability around the mouth. These guys know that they're chewing. They have a, they have nerves that run around the mouth, so they know what they're doing. They also have nerves that go down the length of the arm, so they can feel. But as far as the central nervous system, yeah, not so much. Now, let's see here. The two surfaces that I mentioned were the oral surface or the chewing surface, and then there was the ab oral surface which is on the bottom of the starfish. So the non-chewing side. Uh, it's on that side that essentially you'll find the, the anus. It, the anus is directly opposite to the 
mouth. The blank page is not nice. So we stated that they were deuterostomes, and I, I guess I should diagram that a little bit for you. When you have a first cell and you're a zygote, and at this point you are diploid, when the egg and the sperm fuse, that ball of cells will begin to divide and it'll form this, or that single cell will form a ball of cells. So I'll just draw it like this. And that ball, or sort of megasphere, I guess, if you will, is beginning to, f it's what will form all your bodily systems, everything. So kind of get the idea. And what it will do and this is called invagination. In, uh, let's just get this drawn. I'm running out of room. There we go. I'm going to just switch my colors. I have to hit done to do that. And I'll go to orange here. What will happen is that in deuterostomes, instead of invaginating from this end, what it will do is it will form sort of a hollow region, it invaginates from the anus instead of from the mouth. And that's characteristic of uh, deuterostome-like organisms, deuterostomes. And uh, in human development, we're the same. In fact, many of the advanced animals, that's what they do. It's also a way of putting a lot of these critters together in a group. It's another thing that they all do. They're all deuterostomes from the sea stars. Let's see if I can get this. There we go. The sea stars, the urchins, the sand dollars, they all do this. They're echinoderms. Now you have to always consider what are the body systems. It's the best way to study animals is to say Okay, what is it that puts them in the group? They've got spiny skin, they're deuterostomes, uh, kind of like scavenging organisms. They'll eat pretty well everything they can find. That makes them heterotrophic. A lot of these characteristics all get lumped together. So we figure out that we have an interesting group, uh, a phylum. And then we have to say, okay, well, what are the body systems? Well, at this point you say, well, what's it got sort of like for a circulatory system? Well, I guess the nearest thing to a circulatory system it has, it's pumping fluid around the inside, it has what's called a water vascular system. Now, as you pump things around, our circulatory system delivers uh, dissolved food materials, okay, nutrition in our blood. It also delivers oxygen, exchanges carbon dioxide. It does quite a few things. And as it turns out, this water vascular system can acts sort of as multiple body systems. So it can do respiration, circulation, and it even enables them to move. So there's three body systems here. Which are accounted for just by having a water vascular system. Which is good news if you're a starfish. Or well, we'll just say a conoderm. Getting carried away. So here's our little critter, and when you look at it, it's quite interesting. On this diagram, I'm going to point out what you are looking at and some of the major body systems that, that appear here. Okay, so what have we got? Well, we've cut the ab oral surface of the starfish, and what we've done in each arm, we've sort of exposed different organs, things to look at. I can't use orange. There's way too much orange in this. So I'm going to go with, uh, yeah, purple. Surprise, surprise. Okay. Now, what is here, in this case, um, these little guys right here are what you call ampullae. And to carefully define that, what I should show you is they're hooked on to what this thing right here, and this is known as the radial canal. Okay, so let's put a little note over here, radial canal, and that's because that canal, 
think of a circle, right? That's like a radius going from the center. So they call it the radial canal. There we go. And you see that that radial canal is hooked up to each one of those ampullae. Now I should show this a little bit more carefully. Your radial canal comes down like this and the ampullae go off it like this and the ampulla is just that part. Okay, so it's being filled by the water traveling down the radial canal and the ampullus, singular here, gives the tube foot its access to water. So it's kind of like a medicine dropper. That's really the best analogy that I can give you. And it's, it's smart for it to function that way because what it allows it to do is to sort of squeeze water and it, that gives it its suction cup like abilities. So that accounts for its movement. And I'll show you the, uh, the animation in a second. What we have over here, these are gonads very generalized tissue. Okay, So we've got boy starfish and girl starfish. There we go. And in each arm, move this over a bit, in each arm you will find all three of these structures but for the sake of the diagram they're just showing you one at a time which I think is a, a good more or less a good way to go. This over here if you follow this what you'll see is Let's switch our colors up. Let's hit done. Boop. And <laughs> uh, you know what? I'll go with a very conservative black in this case. This is looks digestive in nature. At least it should to you. That is the stomach. And there's a top part and a bottom part. The bottom part is cardiac and the top is pyloric. If you think back to when we studied uh, the grasshopper and when we studied the earthworm, there were sort of two parts to the stomach. You remember how it had a crop and a gizzard? That's not what we would call it here. We'd say sort of like similar to us in humans. At the top, the top part, the, remember that the food is coming in from below. The top part of our stomach, we have a little valve called a cardiac sphincter. And then in the bottom in human beings, we have what's called the pyloric sphincter. We have sort of two regions of our stomach. So when you look at this guy's stomach here, the bottom side is cardiac, is the cardiac portion of the stomach, and the top, which is kind of up here, is sort of the pyloric portion of the stomach. I don't know why I said sort of, because it totally is. And Although it's hard to see, the anus is right here, so it poops out the top. When we look at this, move this around, you'll wonder what these little sort of black feathery things are over here. These are digestive glands. And starfish are prolific eaters. A starfish will extrude its stomach and it extrudes its stomach over top of what it's eating. And when its stomach is sticking out of the body, it, these digestive glands just work wonders. And what they're trying to do is to create enough enzymes and materials to break down or digest whatever the starfish is after. And I'll, uh, there's a really neat BBC video on the website where a, a baby seal pup had died and it's down on the bottom and nothing's eaten it and the legions of starfish move in on it. You have to go and check out the video. I'll point it out again in a minute, but it shows shows how well these uh, starfish uh, can do their business, specifically digestion. Their number one uh, source of prey, they love mussels. They'll literally get onto a mussel or a clam or an oyster, and by applying their tube feet to either side, they'll suction cup onto the bivalve, and they'll pull until the bivalve gets so tired that it, its adductor muscles give out and it opens up and the starfish will extrude or release its stomach down into the shell and just literally digest the unfortunate mollusk right in its own shell. Okay, so let's pop out of here for a second. So I'm going to turn mirroring off for a moment. Okay, there we go. 
Now, what have we got? The water vascular system of this echinoderm. So it's pretty neat. What a, let's uh, let's zoom in. First couple things that I notice, I'll zoom in like this. Uh, here's your tube feet, and they're moving along. So this thing, as it's moving along the bottom, this is class Asteroidea, or the, the star-like looking echinoderms. This is your garden variety starfish. Its little tube feet move along. In this variety, its arms don't whip. They don't move like... Um, one of its cousins do, the brittle stars, uh, those are sort of uh, star-shaped looking uh, echinoderms like these ones, but those, that variety, the brittle stars, have these very fine brittle arms um, that can actually move, can whip, but not with class asteroidia. They're just kind of surfing along on their tube feet. If you look in carefully here, oops, Zoom in a bit. Oh, I can only get so close. Here you can see the ampullae, if you follow my cursor, and that is the tube foot on the bottom, hooked up to the radial canal right there. This ring-like structure is called the circular canal. Pretty easy to remember. Its name is very descriptive. And you might ask a question, well, where does all the water come from? That little bony structure right there, think of it as an intake valve. It's called the madreporite. And there is a stone canal, literally, that leads down here. So it lets the water in as it needs to. Okay, so I'm going to just, I'm going to zoom back out. Interesting feature on Mac to be able to do this. There we go. There. Okay, so... Water vascular system, zooming in. It's being well shown here. And you can see it pulsing with water as it's entering from the madreporite. The tube feet, take a little up close view here. You can see how they're receiving variable pressure, which enables, it's like squeezing the top of the, of the medicine dropper. And it gives them suction so they can move along. The stomach here... Uh, this is the anus. This, as I defined, was the pyloric section, and underneath is the cardiac section. There are very primitive eye spots. If we want to look at their ability to sense, they do feel with their tube feet. There, there's primitive nerves running up the arm, and as I said, there's a nerve ring around the mouth, so they can feel what it is that they're uh, coming into contact with. They also have a very primitive eye spot. Now that's an that's an achelous or plural, ocelle, which you'll find on each one of the arms, right here. And it allows them to detect um, whether it's bright or dark, where they're interacting. And the madreporite, this is a great shot of it, what basically makes the water vascular system, um, well, it's, it's the input for the water, and the water can come in through the madreporite. So when we do the dissection, I say it's very important to, to locate that structure right away. Very cool looking little thing. I had mentioned, it was interesting here, I had mentioned um, our crinoids and our echinoids, our uh, sand dollars and our urchins, and I'd even mentioned our little sea cucumbers, and now I feel bad because I missed a major group. Ophuroidea. Now, here. I'm, o, oh, o, P, H, I, U, R, O, I, D, there it is, Ophuroidea. Boy, that's a tough one to be able to spell. These guys are a lot like class Asteroidea. And I, I wanted you to see these because they're so neat looking. They're called the brittle stars. And these ones can literally move their arms. And if they're faced with a predator, the, one of the reasons they're called brittle is because they'll leave an arm behind and sort of get out of dodge after that moment and let the predator have an arm while they just take off in the opposite direction. So this is, this is class Ophuroidea, characterized by that large sort of central disc and these long sort of snake-like arms. And it's neat to watch them move because when they do move, uh, let's go back, we go to Ophuroidea. And we'll just go to videos for a second here. And watching them move uh, is sort of fascinating. Let's, 
distinctive character. Okay. I just want to see them move. So I popped out to popped out to a a, a YouTube video. I, I just I mute the sound because it, it it sort of gets in your face. But there you go. You can see it moving along like that. And it's really interesting movement because it's not surfing as a, a starfish would. Starfish themselves they, they don't really move that way. So I just bored a few seconds of that video. You have to forgive me. So what I would tell you to look at, go back to the site, is you go back now and you want to look at the crinoids. So watch this. So pause my video, as exciting as it may be. Check that out. Look at your classic sea stars. This crown of thorns, this thing is voracious. It loves to eat corals. And it will go over a reef and literally kill coral in a ridiculous fashion. Okay, uh, class holothuroidea here, starfish dissection. Uh, that's an important one. When we do go to do the dissection, you can watch the starfish dissection fully before class, or uh, maybe in class just before we do it, and you get a really good sense of how to do this. Plus, I love dissecting everything, so don't worry. Come talk to me. We'll get her done. You can watch these uh, sea stars fight over a scallop. That's always good fun. Okay, So there's some major stuff for you to take in there. So take that in, check it out, and come back to the video. Of course, I'm going to carry on recording this video. We'll see you in a bit. Okay, folks. I'm hoping you had a good time uh, checking out the video. I want to finish off uh, the theory for this. We're nine tenths of the way there, so let's go the full distance and finish off what it is we need to say. All right, there we go. So we had a nice tour of the uh, starfish anatomy, and there's our madreporite. And now, because we had a chance to take a look at that animation, which I think is just fabulous, we know that this is basically a water intake device, sieve-like. That's what they mean. You probably haven't heard that. Sieve-like. I, I, I like to think of it as a valve, but, you know, I can live with the term sieve. Okay. Let you fill in a few things there if you need to. You can always pause me. Remember, if I go too fast, pause me. There's that tube foot, which has a sucker on the end. In a, in a classic quiz, you can get really caught on these. They'll say, you know, label the parts, and you'll say, okay, tube foot, all right, that's great. But then the sucker on the bottom would get its own label. You could make this out of three parts, where you could say you've got the ampullus here. And I'll just do a letter. The ampullus there, the tube foot there, and the sucker on the bottom. Oops, let's make it actually look like an S. That could be a three-part diagram. So you always want to be ready. You wouldn't want to know each structure and more or less what they do. gives them the ability to walk along and this section is good because they'll get on either side of a bivalve and apply all their suction and then they just they just hold on and pull that poor bivalve open and the remember the adductor muscles um, they're very strong but you know they can only hold on so long and these guys will eventually get their way okay so as far as feeding goes Echinoderms have several methods for feeding. We know that some are predaceous. If you looked at the crown of thorns, that thing just moves along eating whatever it can find. Um, actually, we should label it here. So we can have we can have predators. And there's a lot of scavenging that goes on. Whoa. My stylus needs to be replaced. So we got scavenging, which is where they act as detrivores. Ooh, I have to fix that. I do not like that. There we go. Scavenging. And we also have our herbivores. Right? When you look at herbivores there we go there we go as herbivores the the sea urchins 
will chew the hold fast. I mentioned this before of, well, what's a hold fast? Let's see if you guys can remember this. All right. Oops, hold fast of algae. And this should take us to it pretty quick. We'll go to images. So on algae, look at something like this. Here's a feofite algae, a brown algae. They're down here chewing on the hold fast. And the hold fast does exactly what it says it does. It sort of glues the algae to the rock. So in uh, rough weather, any weather, it doesn't let go. And the problem is, there's a, there's a classic image of it. The ocean would be taken over <laughs> by all this algae. So it, it itself, how do you take care of this? If you've ever been to Victoria and you look up on the beach, you'll find, um, you'll find this washes up, this brown algae. And it's not always attached to a rock. Usually what happens is it's holdfast has been chewed away by sea urchins. And as a result, the, water, uh, the algae just washes up on shore. All right, so we'll go back. Sea urchins are pretty neat. When you look at uh, sea urchin mouth parts, I don't think you realize just what they have. Back to this. Let's go to sea urchin. There we go, sea urchin mouth parts. And it's, it's kind of unbelievable. You'll see that they have these very fine little teeth and they grow back pretty well each month uh, they, they just regenerate these in fact starfish are very capable of regeneration and they just gnaw away at the hold fast and they just take in the material and that's on the mouth side these just fine little teeth there's a really good shot of it so now you know they have fine little teeth so a lot of our echinoderms are just sort of like algae eaters they'll just chew them right off the rocks which is good otherwise we have way too much algae so they have a definite role in nature we also know that there's some filter feeders are sea lilies pretty little sea lilies there right now if you stop and think for a sec what what group are sea lilies in hmm well let's see we had asteroidia regular starfish we had Ophiuroidea, which is the one that, that I'd forgotten to mention, but put in anyways, right? The brittle stars. We had Holothroidea, which is like our sea cucumbers. So what was the last one again? Look back and try to remember where sea lilies fit in. They're one of the oldest. In fact, we find fossils of them. How do we know? Well, I should point out that sea lilies, which are crinoids, I went and gave it away, if you look at their fossils, there we go, we know that they're very old because we can find fossilized remnants of them. Lots of hard parts, so these things fossilize very well. And there you go. Fossilized, exquisite detail. And we've found their stalks left over behind, right, portions of them. So we know these are old, and we have the evidence to prove it. So the sea lilies are filter feeders, okay? Grabbing whatever they can in the water column. Ooh, this will be my last lecture with this stylus, I tell you. Okay, so those are our filter feeders. Um not a lot of more information here to give to you we know that they have the ability to scrape the rocks and the sea cucumbers that's kind of the new little bit here where they're talking about what what sea cucumbers will do and that's pretty well eat anything that they can find and we call that anything detritus they'll eat feces anything that's on the ocean bottom that's that's their modus operandi if you will i've uh, been waiting to show you this when sea stars grab onto mollusks, they'll just go over top of them and they don't leave much behind. They're very efficient. In fact, fishermen were ripping up sea stars, tearing off their arms because 
they would come up in the nets and when they'd find them they'd tear off the arms and they thought well this will help protect my oyster farm my oyster beds but if you don't rip right through the center if you don't rip right through here and destroys that central portion of the sea star it can easily regenerate an arm in fact when we do the dissections odds are that you'll find a starfish with a little stubby arm like that because it can regenerate any of these arms that's not a problem it's right here and I'll X marks the spot if you don't tear them through the central ring they'll simply regenerate they've got genetics to regenerate we don't here's another interesting fact if you've heard of something called scleroderma, scleroderma, sclero meaning hard and bone-like, and derma meaning skin, these guys have spiny skin. Well, as it turns out, there's a disorder in humans where we can get spiny skin too. Uh, bony plates will begin to grow in our skin. That shows, well, first of all, it's, it's a very unfortunate condition to have. It could be fatal. But it also shows that we are evolutionarily related to these critters. Whew, that was a big word. I survived it, though. Okay. My slideshow has all these blanks. I apologize, guys. It was I think it was the way I exported it. But that's okay. We'll rock and roll. Uh, that sea star, as I mentioned, will just eat the mollusk right in its own shell. And... It's able to extrude its stomach to do that. So as the stomach comes down, it just stomach just comes out, and it can release its digestive juices into whatever it's feeding in, and then just absorb the result. So it just liquefies its prey and, and slurps it up. Respiration and circulation is accounted for by the water vascular system. So I might as well use all this blank space wisely. The water vascular system, as it's pumping water around, it's bringing oxygen, circulating it, so it's acting as a circulatory system. You're not just pumping water around, you're pump pumping around oxygen. Okay, So respiration, you're getting O2, and you're also releasing carbon dioxide waste. And taking that away goes right out the tube feet, ladies and gentlemen. Circula circulation, um, of course, we're circulating um, oxygen and CO2. I get that. But they're also moving around nutrients. You've got to think that those nutrients from the digestive system have to move around. So do waste products like built-up ammonia. So it's easy for the starfish to just move around its vital nutrients and get rid of its waste products plus it does poop so it's all good it has a digestive system so those thin walled little tube feet as your as the water is passing from them even the tube feet themselves little fine tube feet act as nice little respiratory surfaces Go like that and draw the sucker in there so what that means is right co2 can readily pass out as it builds up, CO2 builds up in any animal tissue. It's building up in you right now. As your cells do work, they produce this waste product, kind of like a, kind of like the exhaust system of a car. So CO2 passes out through diffusion. It's really easy because diffusion, it's more concentrated inside. Okay, you've got a high concentration of CO2 inside of the tissues, and because it's less concentrated, it just passes right out into the ocean water and that's just diffusion diffuses out now conversely because our bodies are taking are using up so much oxygen that let's draw it this way that O2 diffuses into the tissues because oxygen's at lower concentration in our bodies so there you go the O2 just heads on in. So that's a process of diffusion. The thin walled tissue makes it happen uh, because it's not much of a barrier to the exchange of these gases, right? You might, in, in 
in starfish that are a little more fresh, they do have some respiratory tissue. They do have these skin gills. And they're good for gas exchange. But by the time we usually dissect starfish, you really don't see them. Now let's sneak out to the internet and see if we can find skin gills. Because that's about the only place you're going to see them. There we go. Let's see if we can get images of it. Skin gills. <laughs> I think this picture will show it. There we go. It's very small, and it, it, amongst the spines, it's very hard to see it. But there are these little sites of exchange called skin gills. Not easy to see. Okay. Materials are circulated around by the water vascular system, so I think we've covered this, right? Now, the water vascular system, if I asked you all the parts of it, you would need to include, and I'll just use the first letter of each one, you need to include the madriporite, the circular canal, the radial canal, and you know that that leads to the ampullus down to the tube feet. Okay, so there's, there's a lot to that uh, that you don't want to miss. And I guess we could say the sucker. Let's include the sucker just to be really complete. Excretion. Now, excretion is just waste removal. Oops. And by waste removal, you got to understand, whenever you eat something that's protonaceous, even in plant materials, you have to get rid of these things. Okay, ammonia. You might know that. That's a household cleaner. And I've, I've talked about it in this class quite a bit. It's a toxic waste product that must be released from the body. In humans, that's a big function of your kidneys, folks. And NH4, if ammonia takes on an extra hydrogen, it becomes an ion. And the name gets longer, and we call it ammonium. Yes, I'm going to write it all out. I U M. Ammonium ion. Specifically, a cation. I always thought that they should have called the negative one dog ions, but nobody would ever listened to me. I know, I know. Bad joke. So the anus, in this case, is on the ab oral surface. There we go, ab oral side. So, yep, starfish poop. We call this overall process of releasing products, right, excretion. Now, it's not incorrect to say that when carbon dioxide waste pass out that it is excreted. Yes, you can say that, okay? And it looks like they this slideshow got around to mentioning Ammonia, just like me, except I remembered to include ammonium as well. You have to get this waste product out. It's a very strong base, and think of it this way. Would you inject bleach into your tissues and leave it there? No. Ammonia is a strong base like bleach. It's got to go. It has to be removed from the body. And it's just part and parcel. It's just part of the game when you digest uh, plant material, animal material, there's protein in that, and it's got to be excreted. So the waste passes out either through the anus, okay? Um, you've got the tube feet that remove carbon dioxide, the skin gills. They're also releasing carbon dioxide, so let's mention that, right? But remember that it's carbon dioxide. As your this waste product is moving around, you... It, it's circulating around kind of in the water vascular system, so that is being released as well. All right. Response system. I like to think of this uh, as, you got to think of, well, what are our sensors? This is kind of referring to the nervous system. So if you take into account all the major body systems, we just saw excretory, circulatory, respiratory, 
we're just kind of making the rounds on the overall body systems. So there's a nerve ring, uh, which they mentioned here, that goes around the mouth, and they can sense anything that they're chewing on. They make a good point here of mentioning the radial nerves, and those go down the arms, so they can feel what they're touching. So it's all kind of connected up. Starfish can detect if they're upside down um, and right themselves. So they have a sense of gravity. Uh, starfish can also detect light with those little ocelli. On the tips of the arms, there's that little sensor there. A singular one is called an ocellus. Plural, many is... You just cross this out and say ocelli. That's a plural form. And the starfish themselves, they can sense chemicals in the water, things like that. So they have good sensation. They just don't have cephalization or cephalization. They don't have a head, right? They don't organize their sensors kind of, you know, in the anterior end like we do. They don't really need to. They do quite well on their own. Movement. Let's call that what it should be locomotory system all right locomotory system that would include muscles bones things like that right so we know that they're moving and that they're using their tube feet to get the job done and that's how does that work we know that the movement is because of the water vascular system sort of makes it all happen sand dollars are just basically like sea urchins but just really flat and it's neat because there's little movable spines you see a lot around the mouth and that helps them move food sort of towards their mouth the move the spines in the uh, sand dollar sea urchins they can literally move around on them they're not moving around on not not quite the same sort of tube feet maneuver that you saw um, in the starfish. Starfish have spines, but they're just they're just in the skin. These guys have these spines which extend outwards and makes them quite pretty. So most echinoderms, when you think about uh, class Asteroidea, that's your average starfish. They're cruising around on tube feet, right? But the sand dollars and sea urchins, we know that they're doing a little bit more of the spine action which is kind of cool. I, I think it looks neat. If you've ever had one in your hand, it, it's an unnerving feeling to hold a sea urchin. Okay. And the brittle stars, we saw that they could whip their arms and more or less uh, move along. Almost looks like they're doing, you know, the forward crawl when they're swimming. It's pretty neat. Sea cucumbers are cruising along on tube feet. So there's there's five rows of, or well, there's five sections of tube feet going along them. They're, they have pentaradial symmetry, but you, think of it, you'd have to, you have to look at the um, sea cucumber as being pentaradial. Like if you cut sections of it, you would see in those thin cross sections that there are five major regions of uh, similarity. And it's set up just like, just like a star, just like what we've been looking at with the pentaradial symmetry. Reproduction. They have very primitive gonads, and we saw that previously. I, I labeled that. And they, there's no internal um, fertilization. Okay, What we're going to look at with these guys is external fertilization. So the release of sexual cells into the water to fertilize and create a little critter sort of little wiggle-like little critter that swims off and finds its own little spot on the bottom and develops up into a starfish. That's more or less what you're seeing. So it is full-on external fertilization. There's no room inside of a starfish baby for the critters to grow up. It, it just isn't, right? So they release their sex cells into the water and kind of hope for the best. There we go. Open water. I call this a shotgun strategy. Similar to uh, using a shotgun, just just aim in the general direction and let it go.
Now their larvae, this is, they're referencing the point that I made, their larvae swim around and it's good for their larvae to be sort of worm-like. Interesting, isn't it? Worm-like. Sort of make you think about some of their relatives, like, I don't know, maybe the annelids. They've got this little worm-like larva, you know, with segmentation, and it cruises around and finds a place to live because you know, just like you guys one day, you'll move away from home. They have to find their own home. They can't compete with the adults. So they find their own little spot and their own little place to grow up. Um, develop into adults. I think we get the idea. Right? They're on their own. On the ocean bottom. All alone. Different classes of echinoderms. I've pretty well nailed this one. Um, we've got an interesting way that these guys are doing this. And I, I always think this is a little generic. Sea urchins, sand dollars, brittle stars, sea cucumbers, sea stars, blah, blah, blah. If you look back to the beginning of my lecture, we laid them out as asteroidia, holothuroidia, ophiuroidia. Oops, hold that up. So... They're not mentioning them properly here, but at the beginning we did go over these classes, and you're expected to know that because that's that's a little bit more official than the way they've laid this out. Okay, this is a generic way of saying it. That's great, but you should know what the class names are. Sea urchins and sand dollars. Um, just a little bit more background information, right? Um, the, the, it's interesting because the plates kind of form, when we looked at the sea urchin teeth, you could see that there was a um, sort of a structure and their teeth were down here and it had these plates. The interesting things about sea urchins and sand dollars is they have these plates around their internal organs. It's almost box-like. And, and this can be removed um, in one in particular, they refer to it as Aristotle's lantern because it looks like a little lantern box, which is pretty neat. Um, Hey, let's show you that. Why not? We've got time. Oops. Aristotle. Oops. Aristotle's lantern. There we go. And let's see if I can zoom in on that. And this is what they're referring to. Almost looks like a little lantern in the middle. And there you go. There's a nice up-close shot of that. A little more structure, a little more organization than you see like in the starfish. Pretty cool stuff. We don't dissect these guys per se. Um, this would actually be a good one to do a report on because when we, whenever we dissect these in class, we always starfish are just the sort of the run-of-the-mill version of what we look at. But not too often have we cut into something like these guys and really explained their internal anatomy. Very cool. Sea urchins and sand dollars, uh, detrivores and grazer. By detrivore, that means they'll eat anything. Other ones are basically uh, herbivores, grazing on uh, large quantities of algae, usually brown algae. They like them. Sand dollars are benthic dwellers. It means they, they cruise around on the bottom and they're, they're, uh, they can stay pretty protected by that environment. Mud, sand, uh, make it a little harder for th some of the larger stars to get at them and try to consume them. The, uh, when you look at the sort of like giant starfish, they will cruise around and if it's kind of neat because the sand dollars will form a phalanx and they'll stack on top of each other to tr try to protect themselves. But really large starfish will just eat anything that they mow over. And the sand dollars generally do not stand a chance. So sand dollars burying themselves, hanging out in crevices. Yes, I get the idea. Hey, give me my pen. There we go. Sort of more or less defense. I don't know why this made so many blanks. Um, we've looked at our brittle stars. I'm going to cruise through this a little bit. You'll find the brittle stars, and you'll find the, the asteroids, right? Brittle stars are um, really a pretty version of a starfish. The ones that can lose the arm, they cruise around on coral reefs. In fact, coral reefs is where you'd find most of these guys. 
again, what we're looking at with brittle stars, their arms are kind of long, so they can use them uh, for filter feeding. But I tend to think of brittle stars as being detrivores. They're looking around on the bottom for pretty well anything they can go over top of and consume and eat. So I'm going to kind of cruise through that a little bit. Brittle because they have these flexible, gentle little arms. Um, it's neat to watch them leave that behind because it's, it's interesting to say they know they can regenerate it, but they've developed an evolutionary mechanism to leave an arm behind. It's pretty smart that they'll do that. And that arm will wiggle. This is, this is gross. It will distract the predator. Um, so this, you've got this arm that you've let go and it's wiggling away to distract the predator and you just go in the opposite direction, what I call getting out of dodge. It's kind of creepy when you think about it. Like letting your arm hang on behind, right? And it's busy waving at someone while you're running out of the room, trying to get out of there. Uh, sea cucumbers, de detritus feeders. I think we get that. Hello, pen. Come back. So they'll eat almost anything. In fact, they will eat anything. So they're thought of as vacuum cleaners. And that's good because they... It, a lot of sand is just immaculately cleansed by these guys. They'll just pop out that sand, and they, any if there's any particles on the sand at all, they'll clean it right off. So they make nice sand. There you go, sea cucumbers. And you'll find them, They call it's interesting here as they refer to them as herds, cruising along on the ocean floor, and it's not just one, but they'll, they'll clean up anything they find. So otherwise, it would take a very long time for bacteria and the like to sort of break down decomposing matter sea cucumbers speed up the whole process our giant warty pickle little friends uh, sea stars we know about these guys these are the asteroids oh look i gotta mention mailbox nothing like spam in the middle of my show um carnivorous they'll they're basically looking for bivalves to consume Careful, as I said, when you rip it up, if you rip off an arm, it'll just regenerate. And if you do that, if you tear one of the arms off, so I'll tear off this guy's arm. Sorry, buddy. If you tear that off and it reforms into a fully functioning starfish, there we go, not well drawn, but you get the idea, that is asexual reproduction. You just helped increase the population. Fishermen learned this the hard way. Don't rip off the arm. That doesn't kill them. It grows back. And they can grow back from very little tissue, right? As long as they have more or less the central, uh, central part of the body, uh, they'll come back. Creeping along the ocean floor, looking for bivalves to eat. Pretty well whatever they can find. Right, but sea stars are not going to say no to a dead free meal. So it's I would also say they're detrivorous, which you probably haven't heard before, but I'm going with it. Sea lilies and feather stars. Uh, we saw these guys a uh, little bit more of the tropical variety. These are our filter feeders, the ones that I said looked like plants, and they have a hold fast. So pretty neat. What's different here is that they're using their tube feet to catch things in the water column. So when I said filter feeding, I, I didn't really get as specific as saying, well, what's filtering? Oh, the tube feet are. Oh, that's how they're doing it. Yeah, they are. The ecology of echinoderms, we've covered the body systems and how they feed. So you find them pretty well. Um, You'll find them just offshore. We get it. Uh, coral reefs, not too deep. We have to watch them as indicator organisms because if their population plummets, that tells you that something's wrong in the ecosystem, that there's a major problem. And they're part of the food chain. So sudden, well, if we were using a chemical and it was very, very toxic, let's say... Um, those cakes in the urinals those the girls aren't as familiar with these of course but the men will know what i'm talking about there's these little white pucks that they put in the urinal and it's keeps the urinal fresh but have you ever wondered as that dissolves what happens to the chemical in that puck well a lot that chemical can go out to the sanitation 
um, department when they're processing our sewage sewage department is what I meant to say and what if that chemical you know is part of the sewage and after treatment it ends up out in the water table how toxic is that well one of the things to keep an eye on is the echinoderm population maybe that chemical itself is toxic to the echinoderms you need to watch what's going on with them because they're an indicator of the health of our environment never did like those urinal pucks they're ugh, i think nasty stuff sea stars themselves help keep other populations under control and by the populations that i'm talking about here I'm talking about um mussels when i was down at tofino I, there was a whole island mussels are the black ones and it was just covered in mussels they just took over the whole region but as i went by those mussels i noticed there were a lot of just empty shells because the starfish are keeping their populations under wraps and that's pretty darn important if it wasn't for the for starfish other populations would get out of control this crown of thorns though this one's kind of interesting because it's it's really affecting the great barrier reef um you should see it oops the crown of thorns is sort of something to behold it is one enormous starfish and it's called a crown of thorns because when you see its appearance you get the idea um let me put in starfish there we go barrier reef let's go to images and it's it itself there you go that's it it's cruising around you can see now why they call it the crown of thorns and it's it's literally decimating the reef um, and you got to remember if it's eating the polyps that are you know they're producing the coral um, right then and there you can see the difference on the right it's cruised over and basically consumed all those little nadarians and they're important because they're building up the reef but the crown of thorns is killing them so it's kind of a delicate balance um these things are important but the crown of thorns yeah it's considered an outbreak because it's not just one it's many and the coral reef depends on the the coral polyps to secrete the calcium carbonate to build up the reef and these guys are creating a disaster zone so and here's a bonus question figure out what eats these guys keeps them under control because if something doesn't keep them under control well they'll basically eat whatever they can and it's only starvation that'll keep their population under wraps so looks like a little crown of thorns research going on there very neat very neat so i'm gonna pop out of this get back to our our show here um this concludes chapter 28 section 4 um sorry that my slides had a bunch of blanks in them but you get the idea um and i filled in another uh part of our electronic course material anyways ladies and gentlemen i'm gonna sign out of this and have a good one mr b out